Good morning. Welcome to 69th day of 2022. Wow, wow, amazing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. As we begin a brand new chapter in 1 Corinthians, Lord, we already arrived at chapter 7. Speak to us, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 7. I'm going to go verse by verse to see how far we can go today. Amen. So this is now concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me. It is good for man not to touch a woman. Touch? What do you mean? Well, contemporary English version makes it clear. Now I will answer the question you asked in the letter. You asked, is it best for people not to marry? So uh, here it says that the question you asked me in the letter. This is where we get some theologians saying, okay, first Corinthians cannot be first Corinthians because he's responding to correspondence. He wrote the first letter. They wrote back and said, are you kidding me? Then no one should get married. You know, because the argument is, hey, uh, the most common thing that young people say is, I don't know if we are sexually compatible. So how can you know that you're sexually compatible without having sex? So are you telling me I need to marry somebody blindly, not even know their sexual flavor, so to speak? <laughs> so, so Paul said, yes, don't touch a woman. Touch actually means to attach oneself or to mar marry. Is it best for me not to marry? He's talking about maybe then we shouldn't marry. Right? We should just not marry, have one spouse, just have sex with prostitutes. Well, that's not where Paul wants to take the argument. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Keep one. Why? Because the prevalence of fornication in the city, right? I like Aramaic Bible in plain English. He said, because of fornication, let a man take a wife, it's not multiple, and woman take a husband, a wife. Right? Of course, uh, they had polygamy in those days. What he says, one. Let the husband render unto the what? Do benevolence and likewise also wife unto the husband. NASB 1995 Bible. The husband must fulfill what King James calls benevolence. He calls it duty, duty to his wife. What is duty? It's an obligation. It's a sums owed, figuratively. It's an obligation. Well, what, what, does, what is that? Uh, the cross-reference verse I wrote in my commentary is from Exodus 21.10. If a man takes another wife, he must not reduce the food, clothing, or material rights of his first wife. You know, oh, you married when you're 30, and wow, well, you know, you married a 30 year old lady, and 20 years later, you turn 50 and marrying a 20 year old girl, 30 year old girl. So 20 years apart, and of course, he said, well, you know, I don't need to take care of my first wife. Huge wife, huge problem, right? That's why when I went to Brunei, they practiced polygamy. And for men to have three wives, he has to have a certain income bracket. Poor man, you don't get second wife, man. <laughs> you have to make a lot of money to have third wife because they want to make sure that you could provide for this family, that you're just not a sexual pervert, that you want to have five wives, but you know, you're going to have them go work and then, you know, so like become a pimp or something. It does not work. So the obligation is pretty serious. Right? You should provide. 
some of the huge mistakes that missionaries make going to Africa, Africa, and this is missional history. Without really understanding the context, they went to this area and they said, polygamy is from hell. You should only have one wife. Guess what? All the converted Muslims said, oh, that's fantastic. I got three wives. I couldn't afford them anyways. So guess which wife you think that he took? <laughs> right? The youngest one. And so then they kicked all the old one, and second wife, and ugly one, and whatever. And that injustice that caused by well-meaning uh, so-called Protestants caused a riot and basically entire region has become Muslimized. Muslim allows belief. So a little area that Africans just practice polygamy, but now they had no way to fight these missionaries who do it, who's doing this injustice in the eyes of the old wife with the children, became a beggar. And these children said, I'm going to join Muslim. And they become militant Muslim, literally kill all the Christians. And till this day, that area is Muslim. Because so, some uh, unwise Protestant missionary effort. The wife had not power, verse, verse 4, the wife had not power of her own body. But the husband, and likewise, also the husband had not power of his own body, but the wife. The power in Berean literal Bibles says authority. Authority is nothing more than ruling. So I mean it's literal authority saying that no, you need to give authority to each other. You cannot think that you could just rule over. I mean, in that way, uh, Asian tradition, especially Korean, man rules over the house. I, I was just uh, sharing about, uh, I read a few Korean books and they talk about children. Their dream is to eat what's on the father's table. In those days, rice, and fish. I mean, they didn't even think about eating cow, the rice and fish. And the fish that they're talking about in poor days was mackerel. But mackerel was only at father's side and all the children, they don't get to eat it. Why? Because man is the ruler. Man rules. Right? Jenny's mom tells me that when she married, she freaked out because she lived in a Christian home. She's a second generation Christian. And when she went to her husband's household, the dinner starts and grandfather and Jenny's husband, they too have just two people sit in this small table with all this crazy food. And the rest and the family and the children ate at this woman's table. That would be the wrong concept of ruling. <laughs> That's what happened. Verse 5, it says, Def defraud ye not of one another, except it will be cons consent for a time that ye may give yourself to a fast fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempts you not for your in contingency. Contemporary English version, I think I need to read in contemporary English version because that one's so confusing. It reads, so don't refuse sex to each other unless you agree to not to have it, not to have sex for a while, in order to spend time in prayer. Then Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Wow. Right. Sex is important in marriage. And so don't make sex and leverage in your relationship, especially when, you know, 
woman tells her husband, well, if you don't do this, 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 then I cannot have sex with you. Wow. You know, I, I, I read, uh, I did a TED, I heard a TED talk in America that the sexless marriage is a huge problem for marriages. I mean, if you're healthy and you're cap capable, you should have a healthy sex, sex life, right? But because of the stress and workload and whatnot, we're having problems. But also, also the other side is true that don't, if a husband and wife mutually agree on their situation, you should have healthy, normal sex life. But then he says on six, but I speak this by permission, not as commandment. So what is he commanding? He's commanding, do not fornicate. But you know, think about prayer and being apart with one another. It's just my opinion. It's my, it's not my command, it's permission. I'm just asking, right? Take some time off if you need to fast and pray. During the time you could agree not to have intimate relationship other than that right but that is up to you but other than the fact that you need to keep yourself pure keep yourself from fornication verse seven for i would that all men were even as myself but even man hath his proper gift of god one after his manner and another after that all men christians stand there by saying i wish you're just like me who, who was it? He was a widower. He was once married, but his wife died. And he made a commitment not to get married, but live a single life, give his whole life to serve the Lord. The cross reference is from Matthew 19.11. Not everyone can accept this word, he replied, but only those whom it has been given. He's talking about uh, those men who make the commitment to become a eunuch. They literally, you know, cut up their ding dong to, to become inferred. Right? Uh, then he said, yeah, you could do that for the kingdom of God, but it's depending on the gift of the people. Because everybody's different. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. Gift is facilitating prophecy, you know, Romans 12, 6. There's a, a funny story of how Pope went to heaven and then he went to a heavenly library and he was flipping through a book. And then he came out screaming, no. He said, Pope, what happened? He said, oh, the text says, Celebrate, not celibacy. <laughs> John Wesley writes, For I would that all men were hearing even as I, quoting Paul, he writes, I would that all believers who are now unmarried would remain in eunuchs, eunuchs, eunuchs for kingdom of heaven's sake. St. Paul, having tasted the sweetness of his liberty, wished others to enjoy it as well as himself. Wow. Good question. Huh? Those of you are listening to this, oh, what if my wife dies? What if my husband dies? Well, it's your calling. Well, tomorrow we're going to learn. It's better to get married than burn, burn with passion. So if you're the type that just burn with passion, I get married, but if that's their issue, you don't really have that issue. Well, then stay single. Why mess with all these relational ties? Just focus on that. Hey, man, my hiccup is continuing, but hey, don't care. Let's, let's move on. Hey, Amen. I pray that you have fantastic day today, and I'll see you tomorrow. Love you guys. Mwah.